Welcome to church. It's good to see you all. My name is Jeff. I lead the creative team around here. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and it is, man, it is a privilege to be together with you this morning. And uh, I got to say that this gathering is substantially fuller on Time Change Sunday than the previous one. Yeah. You know, it occurred, <laughs> that's just rough, right? We know this is coming. Like how this has been part of our, our whole lives, and we know it's coming, and we're still like, oh, no. It occurred to me yesterday, I was, I was chatting with my wife out on the patio before the thunderstorm rolled in. That was pretty cool, right? We don't get those much anymore. I love those, but I was chatting with her out on the patio, and it occurred to me that this is the third year in a row that I have preached on Time Change Sunday. I sense a pattern from Pastor Andrew. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and roast him a little bit. <laughs> you know where that brother is? He's in Disneyland. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. He's hanging with his family, and it, it'll be great, I'm sure. But I was like, you know what? Three years in a row, that's not an accident. <laughs> that brother's avoiding getting up early and preaching. That's all right. It's good to be the boss, huh? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you're here with us. We are talking about freedom in the New Testament, there's a book called Galatians, and it is known uh, as the Book of Freedom, because every chapter, and it goes for six chapters, every chapter gives us a different snapshot of what freedom looks like in Jesus. And uh, this week we're in chapter two. Last week we launched in, and Pastor Andrew helped us understand uh, what Galatians one was all about, because if you just read the Book of Galatians, um, it is thoroughly steeped in the culture in which it was written. And there's a lot of funky names and a lot of funky places and some really strange ideas. And it, and it, and it can be a little bit thick, honestly. And so we're, we're here pulling it apart together, trying to figure out, all right, it's in God's word, right? So it's useful to us. What does it say to us then? What does it say to God's people now? And uh, last week we, we, we heard, we were reminded that what freedom in Jesus looks like is freedom from feeling like the prosperity gospel, financial security, wealth is actually good news in our life. Freedom from feeling like that is our freedom. We also learned that there's a political gospel where we have this weird blend of faith and, and political ideologies, and we can think that that, if we get that mix just right, it's freedom. And we learned that no, Jesus is freedom. That's not freedom. And then we also talked about the personal gospel. Oh, man. As North Americans, y'all, we struggle with this one. We love to make everything all about us all the time. And we, we sometimes trick ourselves into thinking, if I understand it perfectly, and if I do it just right, then I will be free. And we're like, no, no, no. Freedom is in Jesus. And that theme continues to mor this morning as, uh, as we ho hop into Galatians 2. So get there with me. A uh, device or a Bible, whatever you prefer. Devices are totally okay around here, but sure, I've got two. Uh, it counts. It counts, friends. So before we launch in, I have a question for us. Very, very important question. Seriously, super important. How many fans of The Mandalorian are with us this morning? We got any Mando fans? That's okay. So there's me and like four other people. Perfect. All right. Good. Good, good. So uh, season three just came out. And this is like the most popular Star Wars offshoot. And it, has, and it follows this guy, the Mandalorian. And he, and, and he is part, forgive me for those of us who are super fans, I'm going to explain what this is to everyone else who, uh, whose life is not complete yet because they don't know what Mandalorian is. Uh, Star Wars nerd. Um, he's part of an ancient religion called Mandalorianism. And there was like super strict rules and the rules, if you followed them, you were in. And if you broke them, you were out. There was no freedom in this. And uh, the, only, the only way to be right, to be accepted, was to follow the rules in the way the rules were intended to be followed by those who wrote the rules. And we find in season three a tension between the Mandalorian, whose name is Din Djarin, and wanting, you see in the picture there, that's baby Yoda, right? Oh man, he's so cute. All right, we got like three or four stuffed animals of this guy at our house. We find a tension between him wanting to be able to look 
his little friend in the face, which requires that he take off his helmet, which is like the fundamental rule of this ancient religion. Ain't nobody going to get to see your face. I'm not sure how that works, like when you're taking a shower and you got to keep your helmet on, but um, they figured it out, I'm sure. The tension between wanting to take his helmet off and like have eye contact with his little buddy versus the rules state that if I want to be accepted, I must live this way. And the reason I bring that up, friends, is because we have a really similar situation. It provides a really helpful springboard into Galatians 2. You see, the early followers of Jesus were called the way. If you watch Mandalorian, you know, this is the way. Yeah. <laughs> they were called the way. Isn't that cool? That just sounds way more epic than Christians, you know? Followers of Jesus. I'm part of the way. I think we should come back to that. That's really neat. That's not the point of this message, though. So what we have here in Galatians 2 is a tension between the way of Jesus. And in the way of Jesus, there is freedom from all that has come before. And what is it that came before? An entirely different kind of way. It was the way of God's law. A vast and intricate system of rules and regulations and expectations designed to help people live a perfect life before God so that they might be acceptable according to his standard, which was, in fact, perfection. How did we get this standard? Let's have a quick reminder here. All the way in the beginning, God set up, God handcrafted humanity for perfection. He built us perfect, and he built a perfect place for us. And he put us in it, and he gave us free reign over, over almost everything. Eat what you want, like do what you want, procreate, fill this place up, have an awesome time. But you have one choice to make. See this tree over here? I really need you not to eat anything from this tree because it is not good for you. Trust me on this. And what did human beings do? They were like, oh, bam, they ate it. And from that moment, and it was never about the fruit. It wasn't about the fruit and what the fruit did to the person. It was about the choice. Because in that moment, the father and mother of all humanity decided, and it wove its way into the fabric of every human being that followed, that the best way is the way we choose for ourselves. And we have been struggling with that ever since. And so as we jump into the text here, we find the way of God's law that's designed to help people measure up to this standard that they broke from the beginning and continued to break. And we find the way of Jesus in whose life the perfection of the standard was met. And there's a tension there. And that's what Galatians 2 is about. You have a group of people who are saying, Jesus is an addition. If you want to be right with God, you need Jesus and the tradition. You need Jesus and the rules. You need Jesus and to do this correctly. You need Jesus and to be with the right people. And then you have the followers of Jesus, a tiny growing movement at this point saying, it's Jesus, period. You don't need anything or anybody else to be right with God. So let's jump into Galatians 2. I'm gonna sort of story tell this for you a little bit before we actually look at some of these texts because it's kind of strange, honestly, when you look at it at face value. So you got a guy named Paul who had an encounter with the risen Jesus and it changed his life. And he was a man who had been living under the law and was like the most pro-status law abider of the day. like. You know, if you, could, if you could keep the law and be one of God's favorites, it was this guy. It was Paul. And then he met the risen Jesus while he was traveling in this crazy vision. And Jesus was like, I am all you need. Go and tell others about the freedom you have found in me. And so he went, whoosh, and he turned, and he made a complete shift. And so he was traveling around telling people this message. And he started with non-religious people. See, in the day, 
in the, in the time in which the Bible is written, there are two primary groups of people uh, in tension with one another in the, in the Bible's story. The religious people, the Jewish people that God had called out from all the people of the world, given the law to, and said, live according to my law so that you are in a right relationship with me and people will see that you're doing that and they'll want in because they'll see that your life is better than what they're experiencing. And then there's everybody else. <laughs> the, the not God religious people. The people with a different kind of faith, the people with no faith, the people who didn't care about faith, the whatever. And those two things are in tension here. And so Paul had gone to the non-religious people and was sharing the good news of Jesus that there is a better kind of life and all Jesus needs is faith. He just needs your faith and he will change your life. But in Jerusalem, which was the epicenter of the religious people, you had a bunch of people, longtime followers of God's rules, who were like, uh, no, 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 no. It's Jesus plus the rules. Like, it was, it, Jesus was never meant to, you know, take out the rules. And they were upset with what Paul was doing. They saw the freedom that he had in Jesus. They saw what he was doing, teaching other people about that freedom, that Jesus was enough, and they didn't have to keep the rules anymore. And they were like, whoa, pause, 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 pause. We're going to send some of our best rule-keeping people from the rule-keeping epicenter, Jerusalem, to go to where Paul is to set him straight, to make sure that he understands that it's actually Jesus plus, not Jesus, period. And that's where we jump in. We have the two ways, the way of Jesus and the way of Jesus plus all the things that we think we need to do to be right with God. So let's jump in. What does this way of Jesus look like? Jumping into chapter two here, at the very end of chapter two, we find this statement that sort of summarizes the entirety of the freedom that Jesus can bring. What does it mean to live the way of Jesus? A person is not justified, verse 16 says. What does justified mean? It means made right with God and experiencing a relationship in an ongoing fashion with God. A person doesn't have that happen by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. By the works of the law, it goes on to say, no human being can be made right with God and experience a relationship with him. It's not possible to do. Keeping the rules will never yield the life God intends. Only Jesus will. The life I now live in the body, right now, physically, in this world, on this side of eternity, whatever it looks like then, we know what it's like now, this life I live by faith in the Son of God, Jesus, period. The way of Jesus is the way of faith. What does this faith bring us? Verse 19 says, I died to the law so that I might experience life for God. I have been crucified to the Jesus plus way I no longer live that sort of way. It is actually Christ himself, Jesus, period, enough that lives in me. The life I live right now, this side of eternity, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who, listen to this, I love this, who loved me and gave himself for me. Not that he saw that I was doing my best and I like hit, I hit the standard of the law 85% of the time and I followed 85% of the rules. So he's like, all right, that triggers my I'll give myself for them threshold. He loved me because he made me. Because I was his from the beginning even though I didn't know it. And he gave himself to meet the standard that my rule keeping continues to fail to meet. The way of Jesus is faith, and that faith brings freedom. <laughs> let, let us be reminded this morning that if we gather nothing else from the compelling and also strange story of Galatians 2, we are reminded that Jesus, period, is freedom. There is nothing that you can do to make Jesus happy with you. He already is. There's nothing that you can do to earn God's favor. He's already given it in Jesus. There's nothing that you have to do this morning to check a box to make sure that the rest of your week is on track. Jesus, period, that's it. And friends, this is hard for us to grasp, right? 
We are so used to the way of Jesus plus. For some of us, we grew up in a household where we constantly had to earn the approval of a parent or a grandparent or a sibling, and we, we received from, from a young age and all the way up to now, or maybe even when we moved out, we received that if you do not perform, you will not be accepted. My love is conditional based upon your performance. Some of us are so infiltrated by the culture of our work environment that says the only way that you can earn and you can provide for your family and you can do what you need to do, what you agreed to do, is by constant, continued, improved performance. And we have come to believe that that is how life is built. And then there's just the insidious, sneaky nature of how the United States functions. It is a culture of rules that apply to all people at all times, and you are either following them or you are not. If you are following them, you're fine. If you break them, you're guilty, and you deserve punishment. We all universally understand this, and most of us believe it to, inside of us just intuitively because of where we were raised and the time in which we live. That is the way of Jesus plus. And what happens is we, we allow all of these things that don't seem spiritual at first to infiltrate our souls, and we come to believe that God must then, as the maker of the heavens and the earth, one who built it all, set it all in motion, he must then function this way as well, because he came first, he was at the beginning, so if I want him to love me, I better meet his standard. It's Jesus plus reading my Bible as frequently and as epically as I can. It's Jesus plus praying constantly. The Bible says that, right? It says, it says, pray constantly, pray continually, pray without ceasing. It's Jesus plus prayer. The Bible says, uh, 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 believe and be baptized, right? You got to prove it with your baptism. It's Jesus plus baptism. Everybody, everybody that I know that's been in the church a long time says it's Jesus plus not drinking or smoking. Uh, the, the, the people farther down the road of the faith uh, say that it, it's Jesus plus not wearing your hat backwards in church or having tattoos. Oops. <laughs> the, 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 the people that I, I, I look up to in the faith, they have, they have said to me in, in not so many words that it's Jesus and who you don't hang out with. <laughs> Friends, this is, this is the way of Jesus plus and it stands in incompatible opposition to the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is freedom. The way of Jesus plus keeps us stuck. It is the antithesis of everything that Jesus stands for and everything that he gave his life for and that the power of God rose him from the dead to overcome. Jesus plus keeps us stuck. And the scary thing about it that we learn from our life's experience and that is validated by God's word here in Galatians 2 is that so often we choose it without realizing we're choosing it. <laughs> Before we go any farther this morning, I want to remind you of the truth that describes your life. Whether you want this truth to describe your life or not, doesn't matter. Whether you believe any of this is real, maybe you're a guest with us, love it, glad you're here. You could be sleeping in on Time Change Sunday. Props to you, man. Maybe you don't believe any of this yet. Or maybe you've been around it a long, long time like I have, and you need the reminder. Jesus loved you. See, together with God, he made you. He, he handcrafted you. You are a masterpiece. You are built for the fullest version of life that is possible. But he saw that you had an unbelievable tendency to choose in favor of yourself, to live your own way. The Bible calls that sin. It's, re it's really not that complicated. God's way, my way. I like to choose my way. Well, duh, who doesn't? It gives us a sense of fulfillment and purpose and value and autonomy and power. It's not the way of surrender, which was the way of Jesus. 
Jesus saw that you were stuck there, and because of that, you became increasingly stuck, trying to do the right things, trying to make it right with God by following all the rules, and Jesus knew it wouldn't work because it requires of you something that you do not have to give perfection. But Jesus, as the one the Bible teaches, in whom all the fullness of God himself actually lives in bodily form. He had it to give perfection, and he saw you, and he said, I want you free, his life for yours, his death for your freedom, his resurrection for your life. <laughs> life at its fullest. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come to bring you life to the full. This is not an, a spiritual, eternal, someday statement about heaven. This is about now. Get this, friends. All he asks in exchange for this, faith. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Seriously, think about that. That wouldn't fly in your job. That wouldn't fly in your home. I'm like, Josiah, you take out that trash right now, sucker. I'm like, it's overflowing. This is one of your chores. <laughs> that wouldn't fly culturally, where we're expected to contribute. And so often, that wouldn't fly in the church. And even more frequently, it didn't fly in here because we don't even know what's happening to us. So I want to suggest this morning <laughs> that you make the conscious decision to give your faith to Jesus, whether you've done it already or not. Because <laughs> guess what? He doesn't want or need anything else from you. That's it. You can decide in this moment. And listen, don't expect anything magical to happen. Like maybe you'll feel something inside of you. Maybe you won't. Maybe next time you come to church, it will seem different. Maybe you won't. Maybe the Bible will make more sense next time you read it. Maybe you won't. The bottom line is you have decided to align your understanding of the world and how it functions with what God says is true about the world and how it functions. That is is the biggest shift that any life can ever experience because it reverses our faith in Jesus. Listen, friends, our faith in Jesus reverses the initial decision all the way at the beginning of humanity to decide in favor of ourselves. We decide once more in favor of Jesus, period, nothing else. I just don't even know what to do with this. Like, I was putting this message together. And was, I've been following my Jesus, or my life, Jesus my whole life, trying to. Had some seasons of wandering for sure, and I am epically foolish at times. But I'm like, what do I do with this? Can it really be that simple? It is. The Bible seems to suggest that it is. So why then, right? Here's the question that I found myself asking this week of Jeff, and I invite you to ask it of you. 200 or so of my closest friends this morning. <laughs> Why then am I so stuck so much of the time? If it's that simple, if it's deciding once again to put my faith in Jesus and he doesn't need or require anything else from me, why am I still feeling stuck? Why do I have these areas of stuck in my life? Well, Galatians 2 helps us with that also. So let's actually look at what the way of Jesus plus is. We know what the way of Jesus is. It's freedom. In exchange for your faith, Jesus gives you new life apart from the requirement to prove to God that you are worthy. Jesus' life made you worthy. His resurrection gave you a life that was worthy. So what is the, what is the way that keeps us stuck? Like that way that <laughs> out of both sides of our mouth, we can simultaneously say, Jesus, period, yes, amen, faith, nothing else. And also, I'm so stuck in all these ways, and I feel so shamed and guilty when I don't do these things that Jesus' followers are supposed to do. What's going on with that? You see, we, we, we still believe 
that to be accepted, we must do the right things in the right way to achieve right standing before God and experience a right relationship with him. Faith can't be enough. That's what we struggle to believe, and that's why there are areas in our life that remain stuck. So in the text here, we've got a couple groups that represent this. One, one group, if you read in there, is called the false brothers. Another group is called the circumcision party. <laughs> that is not a party I want to go to. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Just checking if you're awake, friends. That was a joke. <laughs> These are people who believed that if they kept the rules, God would accept them because Jesus was not enough. It was Jesus plus tradition. It was Jesus plus circumcision. It was Je what is circumcision, by the way? That's weird, right? The Bible's always talking about circumcision. Christians talk about it in the Bible. Pause. In ancient times, God needed a physical marker <laughs> for his people to set them apart as part of his unique and special plan to gather all peoples back to them, back to himself because they had wandered away from him. Circumcision, we believe, is what he chose because of the hygiene benefits. Okay? It's that simple. God could have done any, any physical marker to set his people apart, but he chose one of incredible health benefit for them that would help them live longer, healthier lives. Right? Isn't that? There it is. There's the mystery of <laughs> circumcision for you. Solved in the Bible. That's why. So what happened is you have these groups of people, and it wasn't just that they had said, yes, it's, it's Jesus plus these things to be right with God. It's they were teaching this. They were teaching this to other people. There's a, there's a spot in there in the first five verses where it says some of, the, some of the false brothers had actually infiltrated the followers of Jesus because they wanted to spy on the freedom that Jesus brought them. They didn't believe it was possible to be that free. It has to be Jesus plus what we've always believed. Jesus plus the things we've always been doing. Jesus plus the people that make the most sense to us. That freedom can't be real. So they infiltrated their group, the Bible says, to spy on the freedom and Here's the nastiest part. In order to sow that for the purpose of enslaving them in the way of Jesus plus. Oh, man. Actively working against the truth of the gospel. Now, we can, we can hear this and be like, whoa, I would never do that, right? But in a way, some of this sounds familiar, right? Maybe you feel this way or believe this way, or maybe someone in your life that you trust, that you believe to be a follower of Jesus, someone who is attempting to live in the way of Jesus, has actually taught you these things or made a case from the Bible for these things or said these things. It's Jesus plus you going to church and reading your Bible. That's what will yield life with God. To be right with him and to experience relationship with him, you've got to have Jesus for sure and to be praying about it. You know, ultimately, things aren't quite right until it's Jesus and you get baptized to make sure that you can show others that, uh, you know, the inward reality, the outward proof kind of thing. You need Jesus and you, you need to not drink. You need Jesus and you got to be sure to avoid smoking. You need Jesus and you, you, you need to not watch shows like that or, or listen to music like that. Yeah, for sure, Jesus, faith, yeah, absolutely. Faith in Jesus, um, yeah, for sure, it saves us. And make sure not to be around uh, people who are, are really bad because it's easier to be pulled down than it is to pull someone up. So the question, friends, what do you actually believe you have to do to be right with God? Here, here's, an, here's an even more reflective way for us to ask this this morning. And I want to I pause and say, look, if, if you're new to the whole church thing or the, the way of Jesus, and maybe you haven't even decided to officially identify with it, to give your faith to Jesus, like you hear me talking about this morning, this might not feel like an epic thing to you. That's totally okay. Listen in and see what might be good for you to receive from it this morning. I have a hunch that a lot of us who have spent a lot of time in the church 
really wrestle with this. Do you believe it's possible to follow Jesus faithfully without going to church? Can you be a faithful member of the way of Jesus without reading the Bible? Can you be right with God through Jesus without praying? Can you actually maintain your right standing with God and hang out with those people and watch that and listen to that? There might be a little bit of a knot forming inside of some of us. There's our Jesus plus rearing its ugly head. See, Jesus plus keeps us stuck believing that we have to do on top of believing to prove to God what Jesus' life already definitively accomplished for us. We take what was intended to be a gift, freely offered, freely to be accepted, and we place, we place conditions upon the gift that the giver, God, doesn't place. Jesus plus Here is why this is so dangerous, friends. Let me offer you a couple things to think about this week. And I'm not, like, I'm not giving you, I'm not telling you what to do with this. I'm just, because <laughs> I don't even know yet. Like, I'm right in the middle of this with you, and I'm sort of just dropping this here for us. Jesus plus keeps us stuck. Jesus period is freedom. Here's some of the, here's some of the things that happen with Jesus plus. Whether we choose it intentionally or whether it's woven into the fabric of our humanity and it comes out, Jesus plus distorts the truth of the gospel. Right here in the text, we find Paul writing that this whole matter that we're talking about this morning, the tension, the way of Jesus and the way of Jesus plus freedom, freedom plus all the things that prove you're free, right? This matter arose because these false Brothers, this circumcision camp, this Jesus plus community had infiltrated in order to disprove freedom and enslave people in the way of the law once more, the rules. And here's how, here's how Paul sums that up. He says, we did not give up. We said, Jesus, period. We did not submit. We said, Jesus, period. Not even for a moment, listen, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved. Nothing, what is at stake here, friends, is the truth of the gospel. It's not just to, oh, yeah, you know, this person needs to progressively step into, I need to step into freedom more and understand that it's not about the things, it's about Jesus. No, it's the truth of Jesus himself that is at stake because Jesus, with his life, his death, and resurrection, said that it's me, period, nothing else. And when we add things on top of it, believing that it is those things in addition to Jesus that make us right, we are taking God's truth, ripping it apart, and putting it back together in a way that that makes sense for us. Jesus plus distorts the truth. It's not so innocent. What else does it do? How else does it keep us stuck? It creates fear. So in verse 12, you find Paul challenging Cephas. Because Cephas regularly ate with the non-religious people. And according to the Jesus plus camp, that would make you unclean and therefore having broken God's rules and thus unacceptable to him. He regularly ate with the non-religious people before the religious people showed up where he lived. However, when they came, it's right in here, verse 12, when they showed up, he withdrew from the non-religious people he separated himself from them because he feared the circumcision party. He feared what the Jesus plus people would do and say and think about him. See, if, if, we, if we keep adding things that we have to do to prove to God we are who we say we are as his children, 
it creates fear and hypocrisy inside of us. Because what happens is we give that plus, Jesus plus, that plus begins to have control over us because if we don't do the plus, then we don't measure up and then punishment is coming. And we are punishment avoidant people by nature. And that which we fear is that which controls us. And when we fear not measuring up, especially around people that we perceive to be measuring up, it leads us straight into hypocrisy. And that's what happened here. You had a guy who was beginning to actually experience freedom, Jesus, period. So he could eat with the people he could never eat with before. He could have the food he could never have before. He could have conversations with people that he could never have before until the religious people showed up and he was fearful of what they would say about his freedom. And so he reverted back on it so as to appear acceptable by their standards. This might sound familiar. This might sound familiar to some of us. We fear not being approved, right? Especially in like a spiritual setting. We fear not being approved or accepted by spiritual people, by Jesus people, by Jesus himself, by God the Father, whatever it is. And thus, if we're not accepted, what does that mean? Am I punished? Am I not good enough? Am I not worth anything? Am I... And so it leads us to do hypocritical things. We live one way at church and another way entirely the rest of the time because the church has the religious people and it's important that, they, that I appear to them as though I believe the same things that they do even though I have experienced a measure of freedom in Jesus that they do not seem to have. I don't really have an issue with drinking or smoking but I act like I do when I'm around people who do because they don't seem to understand freedom the way I do. Or maybe it's that you agree. You find yourself in a moment where these things are being discussed and you agree in that moment even though you don't actually agree. Hypocrisy. Or you need to speak up because you can see people that you care about heading in a direction theologically that you know not to be true because the freedom you've experienced in Jesus has shown you that there is a different way and that the way of Jesus is the way. But you stay silent so as to appear in alignment with their lack of freedom. Jesus, plus friends, it keeps us stuck. So I, I wanna offer you this as we wrap things up together this morning. One final question, friends. Is there anything in your life that you are afraid someone will find out that you are not doing for the Lord? There's your Jesus plus right there. You're stuck. That's what Jesus plus does. So let me offer you in the closing moments here the reminder that you have an opportunity to choose Jesus, period. That the way of Jesus, period, requires that we die to the way of Jesus plus. Look at the text. I died to the law. I died to Jesus plus so that I might Jesus, period. So that I might live for God. I have been crucified to Jesus plus so that I might no longer live, but Jesus, period lives in me. It requires nothing less than a decisive decision on our part to say no to Jesus plus and yes to Jesus, period. Remember that you can decide this right now. In this moment, you can decide it in the parking lot. You can decide it again in the car on the way home. You can decide it as you fall asleep tonight. You can decide it once more as you're waking up tomorrow. Because friends, it is not, it is not complicated. It is simple. It's difficult, but it's simple. It's simply saying, 
I will believe and I will trust that Jesus is enough for me to experience everything God desires of me and from me and that I do not have to do anything else because Jesus already did it. And until we say that again, and we decide it again, and we decisively pick it again, and we say it again, and we choose it again, and we decisively choose again, and pretty, pretty soon we look back and there are years of decisively choosing the way of Jesus against the current of Jesus plus approval, will we realize we have lived a life of freedom. So I would, I would offer you the reminder that it's simple and it's worth doing. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is interesting. <laughs> that it is something so old can be so new and something so ancient and, and situated in a time can be so fresh and involved in our lives now. Thank you for building it like that. And I ask that you would help us as people this morning uh, to choose Jesus, period. To step each day one step further, decisively away from Jesus plus. And it is in his name that I ask all of this over us for our good, for his glory. Amen.